All right, welcome everybody to the Albright Institute for a joint lecture from the uh, between the Albright Institute and the Tantour Ecumenical Council. Uh, we are live streaming tonight, so the standard rule applies. Everyone in the audience, please don't do anything weird. <laughs> Um, just a short introduction. Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming, especially this late night. It's seven o'clock here in Jerusalem. Uh, our usual hour for lectures is four o'clock, but we had this great compromise for seven. And it, <laughs> it's really nice, actually, because I see a whole new crowd of faces that we haven't seen before. And I'm really uh, enthusiastic about our future relationship uh, with Tantour. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, the uh, representatives of the representative office of the Czech Republic in Ramallah who have come out tonight to support uh, their countrymen in his lecture tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, and also, of course, our colleagues from Tantour, uh, many of which are here tonight and watching um, online tonight. Uh, I will now introduce uh, Robert Smith, uh, who will introduce our lecture for the evening. He's the academic director for the Jerusalem Global Gateway Program, which is a global consortium of University of Notre Dame institutions, which Tantour Ecumenical Institute is a part. So, Robert, please. And next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Very little money. <laughs> As Matt said, my name is Robert Smith. I'm the academic director for the University of Notre Dame's Jerusalem Global Gateway. We share space with Tantour Ecumenical Institute, which is located in the far south of Jerusalem, between Gilo and Har Homa, next to Checkpoint 300 on, on the other side of the wall, next to Bethlehem. It's a pleasure to be here tonight for our first joint event with the Albright Institute and, and the Jerusalem Global Gateway. We appreciate your hospitality. It's an amazing place to be, and we look forward to being here many more times. Um, it's, a, it's a thrill for us to be partnered with the Czech government for this amazing evening. Um, and we especially want to welcome His Excellency uh, Peter Stari, the representative of the Czech government, uh, Czech Republic for Palestine, uh, with offices in Ramallah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for us because when the, the Czech representative's office approached us about the possibility of identifying scholars who could be part of the conversation in Jerusalem. We, we jumped at the opportunity because we're always looking for fresh perspectives, fresh voices uh, that we wouldn't be able to pull out of our own networks. And so these opportunities are very important for all of us. And so it's a, my distinct pleasure to welcome Yuri Yanak for, for this lecture this evening. Uh, Yuri is with the Czech Institute of Archaeology. And they'll be speaking to us tonight on the wooden book of the dead and mummification manual, which were items discovered in Czech excavations of, of Abu Sir. And uh, so a history of what the Czech presence has been in Abu Sir and also the significance of these findings. So Dr. Yeri, you are most welcome. Thank you. Is it working correctly? Yes. Is it working? Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to be here in such a great place. And thank you for uh, thank thank you uh, to the Tantur and to the Albright. Uh, and uh, and tonight I would like to take you to Abu Sir which is, let's say, 25 uh, kilometers south from Cairo. And it's a locality which uh, has three main uh, spots. And we work there in three different teams or three, three, three different groups of uh, scholars. The first group focuses on the uh, royal necropolis of Abu Sir with the uh, pyramids of uh, Fifth Dynasty kings. The other group of uh, scholars focuses or uh, excavates at Abu Sir South, which ho which holds uh, at private tombs of the old uh, kingdom. But I am part of the third group of uh, scholars, which uh, focuses on the shaft tombs of the late uh, period, which is mainly from the time between 550 BC 
to 525 BC. As you can see, uh, the shaft tombs located here, or you can see one of those here, are quite close to the pyramids of the five, uh, fifth, uh, fifth dynasty kings, which was uh, done deliberately because even though it's quite late in the period, these uh, people were still uh, wanting to be buried close to the ancient kings and to the ancient pyramids. Although I could speak about the big discoveries of the Czech missions, like the tomb of kings, tomb of queens, or princes, or princesses, I will try to focus on two smallish, uh, smallish items here today to show that the size and the, and the material doesn't really matter. The first item I will be speaking about is actually a piece of wood. The other one is a small inscription. But these two items have big connotation in Egyptology. They bring new discoveries, new, new insights into ancient Egyptian religion. The first one was found in the tomb of Eufa. The tomb of Eufa was uh, discovered in 1996, and it was a big discovery because the tomb was unrobbed, full of text, with a sarcophagus and a uh, coffin and a mummy, still intact in the place which was a terrific discovery. I must say that uh, Eufa's tomb and mainly his burial chamber is filled with magical and religious text. All the walls are covered with uh, the pyramid text, with the Book of the Dead spells, with the coffin text, and even with texts that are unknown. Uh, here you can see a part of a scene that it's located on the eastern wall of the burial chamber. It's a scene of a resurrection of the person who himself venerates a beetle or a scarab beetle that brings up the sun from the darkness into the light. And it's a, it's a scene of a, a personal and a cosmic resurrection in one, in one joint event. This small thing here should be what we call the ben ben the the uh, the, uh, the primordial piece of land the first land that was uh, created but usually the ben ben has a shape of a pyramid or or or, or a, of a small hill in this case you find the ben ben shaped like i don't know how to describe it it's it's strange. And why it is so strange? Because actually, it's two things. It's a Ben Ben stone, and it's a tip of a snake's tail. Because the tomb is obsessed with snakes, or the owner of the tomb was obsessed with snakes. So the whole northern tomb and the western wall are covered with depictions of snakes like being headed snakes and two-headed snakes and, a, and something that we call the basilisk because it's a snake with wings and legs. And actually, the text says, whoever sees this snake dies instantly. And the coffin is round with the snake with nine heads. And the tomb is rounded or, uh, or circled with a snake. And this ben -ben stone might be the tip of the universal snake that circulates around the world. And it's the end of the process of the person through the underworld, through the body of the snake. So the tip of the snake is the point where you leave the underworld into the light, into the sun, and the person gets resurrected. But we will speak today about as I said, a smallish discovery that wasn't found in the tomb of uh, Eufa itself, I mean, in the burial chamber, but in a small shaft 
that use uh, that used to be the entrance shaft to the burial chamber of uh, Ufa. And in in this shaft, my colleagues found a small uh, hidden uh, burial that when they uh, opened it, it looked like that. It was a small space filled with a coffin and a destroyed box of uh, the Ushap uh, for, uh, for, uh, for figures. And in this small space, uh, what, what was inside was a burial of a priest called uh, Nekau or Neferi Preseneb Nekau. And when my colleagues took out the coffin and opened the big uh, coffin, inside there was another, let's say, anthropoid coffin. And inside the remains of Nekau. But what was uh, striking, in between of those two coffins, in between of uh, the wooden coffin and the anthropoid coffin. On the left side of on, on the left side of uh, Nikau, tablet was found. Just at the place where he would have had his arm, so it's a place really close to him or near to him. And this tablet was uh, later identified as a part of a book of the dead. Actually, it was so strange to find a book of the dead written on a wooden tablet that nobody expect this piece of wood is a part of the book of the dead so uh, because usually you find book of the dead written on uh, papyri on scrolls if it would be a scroll it would it would look like this on the day of the discovery or you can find parts or of the Book of the Dead on amulets, uh, uh, Ushaptis, or Mumien Binden, or the mummy wrappings. But in the case of Nico, everything, or a big part of the Book of the Dead, was uh, written on wooden tablets, which is still strange. It's actually, I must say, it's the, the one wooden Book of the Dead, or as we say, is the only book of the dead because you can turn the pages. So it's the only book of the dead. Uh, in, on the day of discovery, it looked like that. There were two strange uh, system how the book of the dead was uh, written on the tablets. The first group of uh, tablets was uh, covered with text in red, uh, in black ink put directly on the wooden tablets. Uh, you can find here, uh, the script is quite quite nice. I must say it's uh, hieratic, but, uh, but written in a skillful, neat hand, rather easy to read, except the places where, where it's broken or, or washed out or destroyed. But there is another group of uh, the tablets, and on those uh, tablets, the spells of the Book of the Dead were written not directly on the wooden tablets, but on a layer or thin uh, layer of stucco applied on the tablet. Why? Because the wood was not, how to put it nicely, it was not first quality wood. So in order that uh, the scribe could put the spell down on the tablet, he had to put a small layer or thin layer of uh, stucco on the tablet and then even he, he, he could put down the, the, um, the inscription on the tablet. Unfortunately, as it happens, it's time to uh, do all the research in the year of the discovery. So we had to stop uh, doing the research directly on, on, on the spot or at the spot. And uh, the, team, the team returned only in the year 2007, which is four years after the discovery of, of the tablet. And we tried to, to take as much as possible from the tablet 
to do what is really first quality. It's collapsing and it will be easily destroyed by anything or anyone. We had our at the place who did the best job he could do. His name is Martin Dvořák and he, he made this out of that. So uh, this is the same picture, the picture of the same piece after the restoration and before the restoration. So he did really his best, but still not all the signs and not all the spells were, were really clear, visible. So we needed to do one more step. We used our computers and the programs like Photoshop and others in order to get something out of the almost tablet. So this image was uh, virtually cleaned in a PC into this image. So we can get another signs out of the illegible tablet. Actually, when I was uh, presenting this found and the first presentation I have in I had in 2003, it was in Bonn, I think, I presented all the scholars with this picture and said, unfortunately, uh, this tablet is destroyed and illegible and we will never get anything out of it. <laughs> and in four years, I came to Bonn again and said, I'm, I'm really sorry, I was wrong that we, we really got something out of it. But luckily, we, could, we, we were able to read the main parts of the text and main parts of the Book of the Dead. So uh, this is the reconstruction of uh, Nekau's Book of the Dead with all the spells and all the text we, we can get out of the wooden tablets. Uh, originally, there were only six bigger tablets, a bit like this, and uh, the the text were uh, written on both sides of the wooden tablets. Only the stuccoed tablets have uh, the text applied only one side of of the tablet, so you can really turn the pages like this, and then the stuccoed one like that. So as we say, it's the only book of the dead. And, but at the end, this all archeological experience was over. And we have to focus on the book of the dead itself. What is the, what is the real message of this particular book of the dead? So in, in order to do so, we needed to, uh, build up the uh, text, how it should be read, how the whole Book of the Dead should work. And this is the main, or uh, this is the whole uh, sequence of uh, Nikau's Book of the Dead. Uh, this arrangement uh, corresponds with the late period arrangement of the Book of the Dead. Nothing special about that. But if you know, some basics of how Book of the Dead works and what spells are there and what are the big spells and what are the important spells. And if you look for a longer time, this uh, sequence, one thing is uh, striking. These are not mainly the important spells because some important spells are missing, like number 30, number 125, number uh, 110, 105, 100, even 17, which is the important one. Why? Because the scribe deliberately chose only the short spells. It's the short spells only. So he knew, he knew I have six tablets here. My space is really limited. I must say what I need to say, but shortly, briefly, and compact. So he put the important spells out of the short ones. And in, in the case, for example, of uh, so-called spells clusters, we have like eight 
spells called the transfiguration spells or the transformation spells how to be transformed into a falcon how to be uh, um, transformed into a bar how to be transformed into something else and he chose only the first one out of all the cluster he chose the first one as pars pro toto like i just want just one and that's it so the book of the dead of nikau shows that it was done de uh, deliberately like this knowing the uh, theological background uh, uh, knowing how the book of the De dead should work in a magical way but knowing as well that the space is really limited and that it should be stored next to the body and the space is limited there as well so it's a good story of uh, nikau's book of the dead uh, but the main question remains, and we will try to answer it at the end of the talk. But now let's, let, uh, uh, let us uh, focus a particular, how to put it, uh, something that happened the wrong way turned out to be good at the end. Because from every year, parts of the Book of the Dead of Nico were lost, fallen off, flaken off, destroyed by anything, because it was so precious that you, uh, you just look at it and it, and, and it was destroyed. <laughs> and especially those uh, tablets with the layer of uh, stucco, were so fragile that we were afraid to breathe next to it. And from year to year, it was looking more like this, unfortunately. Even though we did the best and uh, the Egyptian colleague did their best as well. But that's how it is. But at the end, we find out that the flaking has a pattern. It was destroyed in, in a pattern. You can see those lines going from up down and from from left to right so at the end we found out that it's not destroyed because of us it's destroyed because there was a grid on 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 the stucco before the text was applied on the tablet and why there was a grid because these two tablets worked as uh, scribal tablets or uh, tablets for scribal uh, pupils how to 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 know how to write to draw so at least we know the story of the piece of wood how it, uh, it functioned before it was used for Nekau's book of the dead it was a scribal tablet uh, used for scribes and schools but the main question remains, as I said, why Nikau chose wood, which is strange. Because if you are an Egyptian, I mean, ancient Egyptian, and you are writing or putting down a religious text, the best way is to put it or carve it in stone because it remains, it's eternal, and you want it to be eternal. Or you, if you are writing an, uh, a religious text, you take a, a papyrus scroll because it's something extra, something that remains not so long as a piece of stone, but it does remain. But wood is like not a second option, but it's a third and fourth option. But why he deliberately chose a piece of wood? It might had been so because in the time of the late period especially uh in the time of uh, uh Nekau, it's as i said uh, 550 bc to 520 bc it's the sayid persian period a time of war a time of uh, struggle a time of 
a time of difficulties. And we know only a few papyri, a few papyri of a book of the dead from this particular period. So it seems that a, a papyrus, a papyrus scroll, was a scarce commodity in that time. And the sources were limited or the scribes were busy or something, you know, doing something else. We only know a few papyri from that period. So we know that Nekau himself was a priest, maybe even a scribe. So he took the next option he had, he took the scribal uh, his office and he, maybe himself, maybe not, put down the Book of the Dead for himself like this, out of the short spells of the Book of the Dead. Strangely enough, his uh, title was the Guardian of Papyrus. So he was called the Guardian of Papyrus, and he, was not, and he didn't have a papyrus for himself, which is really strange. But again, the wooden Book of the Dead of uh, Nikau is a big help in this case, because the other peculiarity of the scribe is that he was obsessed with determinatives, these little signs at the ends of the words. He, when normal scribe has one, he has two. When normally there are two determinatives, he has three of them. So we know this uh, title, the guardian of papyrus. There is a determinative of a papyrus plant, but he himself put another one there. So he's a guardian of a papyrus, and there are two determinatives, papyrus plant and a piece of stone. So we know that the guardian of a papyrus doesn't mean a guardian of a scroll or a plant. It's a guardian, a priest who is in charge of amulets in shape of papyrus, probably. But he doesn't really do stuff with scrolls. So he really didn't have a papyrus for himself. That's why. So he, he took the wooden book of the dead for himself, made of wood. So this was the first smallish piece of our excavation. I wanted to show you uh, this particular because I like, and because you can anywhere else. You cannot see it in the museum because it's still stored in our excavation storage room. So it's a, it's, a, it's a unique chance to see a unique uh, object. Now to show you the, the other artifact, we have to go up again from the tomb of Nikau. This is just focusing on wood. Up again to the Shaftum uh, field in Abusir. And we will go out of Eufa here into the tomb of Menachib Nekau, just next to it. Uh, Menachib Nekau was a general of the army back in his old days. And inside the tomb of uh, Menachib Nekau, we have a similar uh, nicely uh, designed uh, burial chamber with, with a really wonderful text and images in it. But again, I will not focus on the big issue, but I will uh, be speaking about a smallish found find next to the burial uh, chamber. We will speak about mummification ritual. Egyptians were obsessed with mummification, as everybody knows. And that's because they believe that the body has to be intact and has to exist even after the death of the person. So that's why they wanted to uh, make an eternal body out of the body of the deceased. They were preparing the body and the, and the deceased and his soul for an eternal life, in his, uh, both in his uh, corporal and a spiritual way. Here you can see a normal mummy, and here uh, three are the parts of, uh, let's say, the body of the disease. His heart in a shape of a hard uh, amulet with uh, 
Book of the Dead text on it. Here you can see the canopic jars that uh, used to uh, store uh, the organs of the disease. And, you, and here you can see a nice picture from the Book of the Dead actually where the bar of the of the disease, which is something like a soul, but it's not really a soul. It's uh, the manifestation of the person's supernatural powers. Some some call it soul, but it's not really a soul. The bar reunites with the body every night. It has to reunite with the body in order to keep alive. But we will not speak about the bar, about the heart, we will speak about the mummification. And we will speak about the mummification uh, that uh, was uh, not mummification itself, of course, but the mummification deposit that was found in uh, one of the shafts ne next to the uh, tomb of Menachibnekal. Again, it was a small shaft, this time on the south side of the tomb. And when um, my colleagues went down the shaft, which is some 20 meters below ground, this is the shaft, they found an E-shaped e -shaped space, completely or almost completely filled with uh, M4A. Like all the three parts of the E sign were filled with uh, vessels and amphorae. And even those uh, amphorae were filled with smaller vessels. So it was a pottery paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Me, myself, I'm not a pottery person, so it was not a big deal for me, but uh, luckily, luckily those, uh, or, or, or at least some of those uh, amphorae for texts, and that is the point where it gets really interesting. Because there were amphorae and small vessels stored within those uh, amphorae. And some of those uh, vessels, as I said, bore texts. And these, all these texts were related to the uh, ritual of mummification. It happens when you find an uh, uh, embalming deposit or the embalmer's deposit that there are vessels used uh, during the mummification process. There are uh, pieces of uh, materials uh, used uh, during the mummification. But in this particular discovery, those texts uh, identified the materials used during the mummification on the pottery vessels which is more in which is more interesting and more important but the most important part comes when some of some of the text or some of the inscriptions speak about the days of mummification when to use the particular substance. So it says natron, which is the thing that helps to dry the body out, and says natron, let's say day 24, then bags and linen day 25th. And it, like, it's a day-by-day -day manual how to do the mummification of the disease. The first uh, text uh, mentioned red linen and or bags. Those bags uh, mean a small, small linen bags that uh, used to store natron in it. Small baglets or bags with, uh, with natron. And then, then there's this red linen. Please, if I forget to explain why it was used, remind me at the end because the red uh, linen is really important or really interesting. So in this case, it says uh, day 24 red linen bags. So it means that the red linen and the bags were used on the same day, which is really important. Then we have the red linen 
of the children of Horus. So, as some of you know, the children of Horus are four gods, usually connected uh, with four um, corners of the world, with four winds, and with the uh, inner organs of the body. As we can go back, these are the four sons of Horus. So they are the protectors of the inner organs. So if the text says red linen of the children of Horus, it's a red linen used to used in the process of embalming of the inner organs. What is really important here that it doesn't say the bags. It doesn't connect the bags with the inner organs at all. There, there is no text bags of the children of Horus. Again, I will get to it at the end. There is this uh, natron of the children of Horus, which is the substance that helps to dry the inner uh, organs. Then we have uh, bandages, two kinds of uh, bandages that help to wrap the body uh, uh, after it has been desificated. Then is the resin and myrrh, especially fresh, uh, literally green. And there are even, even vessels that speak uh, that a kind of uh, green eye paint and ointment should be used for the mummification. Uh, when, when we put all the list together, of, uh, a, a list of all the substances uh, mentioned in the inscriptions, we made, uh, we, we made this list. It's red linen and bags mainly. Then it's the red linen for the ch children of Horus. Then it's some, some natron. And then <coughs> some strange thing appears. It's a beer potion. What's, what's that? We do not really know. Some of my colleagues say it's, uh, it's something, it's a treat for the priest. <laughs> uh, some, some colleagues say it's uh, a, a potion that is used instead of uh, wine to, uh, to make the body cavity nice, nice smelling and not dirty. But I, me, me myself, uh, uh, I cannot imagine put, to, to put a beer uh, potion into someone's body cavity. I don't know. Uh, then there's then then there are those balms and bandages and pieces of cloth. Then it's resin, resin, myrrh, 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 natron, and balms. At this point, I have to I, 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 I have to stop a bit and return to what we do really know about the mummification. The primary source for mummification, for I mean, for the process of mummification, <laughs> was uh, of course uh, Herodotus his histories when he speaks about how the Egyptian mummified and that then there were mummification. Uh, three levels of mummification for the rich ones, for the poor ones. Everybody knows that. This is the primer sort. Then the religious text of ancient Egypt comes. I mean, pyramid text and the coffin text and Buddha, Book of the Dead. But these texts are religious texts. They do not speak about the surgical process of mummification. They speak about how the person goes through the underworld and somehow is mummified during the period. But it doesn't really help us to understand the real process of mummification. Then we have something called the ritual of embalming. Although the title seems promising, it's again a ritual text. It's a text that should be recited along the mummification process. So again, it's you know, religious spells and religious texts, hymns, and so on. So it doesn't really say what to do on what day. Then uh, we have uh, administrative documents. 
which luckily is something that we can actually work with because it says this person has ordered this amount of resin, this amount of uh, natron for his mummification. So we know what was used, but again, we do not know the steps, the original steps, how to do how, or how to make a mummy in several steps. That's when the uh, embalmers uh, deposit come come to help with their tools and vessels and uh, the materials and the substances or the rest of resins and that could be analyzed. So this is a great help. A great help, of course, is uh, the modern techniques that could be applied to mummies like x-rays, for example, or CT scan. You can make a perfect x-ray of a mummy so you can know how it looks like or how it was mummified but again you do not know these little steps uh, by the way on this picture you see uh, small bags with natron so this is what the text speak about then uh, we can we can uh, analyze I mean chemically analyze everything that it's in the mummy or on the mummy, we can even analyze the small bags. And there are some mm, scholars who even undertake experiments, like on humans or on uh, animals, especially on animals. And those experiments, especially those experiments on animals, proved that. Uh, Herodotus was not, was not really right, that uh, the body should not be <coughs> emerged into uh, a, a, a solution of natron, but it should be covered with loose natron, and his body uh, cavity should be filled with uh, natron as well, in order to be desificated. And these experiments also showed that uh, if you put a loose natron into the body cavity, it will uh, get somehow stuck in the body and you, and you had a difficult time to get it out of the disease. So that's why they use the small bags of natron. You just put these little bags, it, it will soak uh, uh, so the so the liquid, and then you easily put all these small bags out of the body, body uh, cavity out. But how it was done with the loose natron? Because the experiments or the person who uh, made these experiments, uh, she writes that it was really difficult to get the natron out of the animal body because when she used uh, a rabbit, for example, it got stuck behind the ears and behind the legs and it was really difficult to take it out. And that's when our discovery comes in again with the red linen, because it's a linen that you put over the body, put the natron on it, and then you easily throw it away with the red linen. And that's why uh, the red linen and the bags come together always, or almost always, because it's the same day when you apply the natron in the body cavity is the same day when you apply the natron on the body. So you use, I would imagine that first you use uh, the small bags into the body cavity, then you cover the body with the red linen, then you uh, apply the loose natron and wait several days. But what is st striking here is that all the days when put together, they start only on day 24. They, they do not start at day four, for example, when the mummification should have started. Why? It's really difficult to explain why it starts so late. But it took us some time to understand 
the process. But at the end, we realized that at the beginning, the priest or the embalmer or whatever, at the beginning, he knows perfectly what to do. He doesn't have to have a manual or he doesn't have to have a, a, a vessel with an inspection inscription saying day one natron or day one water because it's obvious that he will start with cleaning the body and uh, shaving and applying the natron on day let's say five but he had to know exactly when to change the nitron because it's not there for the whole um, desification process it should be changed at least once or twice uh, during the uh, drying of the body, as proved by the experiments. Because our colleague uh, Salima Ikram from Egypt, she did some of those experiments and she found out that it, the natron had to be changed at least once in 10 or 20 days. So this is when it starts, it starts with day 24, Maybe because it's the first day when you change the natron. And that's why you need to have the bags prepared, the, the linen prepared, and then again, some other time. And if you look at it, like in the groups of what is here, so from the beginning of what we have until day, let's say, 32 or 36, it's only the bags and the linen. So until day 26, for example, it's the period of the desification of the body. Then on day uh, 26 until to, uh, 22, it's the period of the mummy wrapping because we have only bandages and cloths mentioned. And then it's the final stage of the mummification of, or of the uh, embalming when you put balms and resins and myrrh and eye paints. It's the, just the final touches of the mummification. So I was misleading you a bit when I was uh, speaking about the mummification manual. It's not the complete manual, but still it's the best we have. It's the best how we can proceed from one step to another. And when we put all the Abu Sir uh, findings uh, together with the findings of other colleagues that were busy with uh, understanding the administrative documents, uh, Herodotus and uh, the ritual text, these other uh, sources speak about how the mummification uh, process was done. And we put our part in it. And you, and you can see that it fits really nicely into each other. And it seems that really the first, the first days of mummification were the cleaning days or the cleansing days. Then for, uh, let's say, 30 days, the desification process takes place in several steps that the, that the natron has to be changed or refilled and the bags should be taken out of the body cavity and filled again. And then we have the period of, let's say, 10 to 12 days when, when the mummy or the body is uh, covered with uh, resin uh, or cloths and uh, mummy wrappings. And then it's the final 10 to 20 days period when the body is uh, finalized with resin and eye paints and myrrh and uh, in order to smell better. Actually, actually, uh, there is there is a, an, ex, an, ex, an inscription that says, put it on the body uh, to smell nicely. So there is something that should be applied on the body in order to prevent the body from smelling. Uh, 
So that is the other the other uh, discovery that I that, that I took part in, and I would like to share my uh, experience with it with you. So in order to leave the topic, we have to leave back up again to the Abu Seal field, and I think the best way to finish it is to have tea, for example. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, you'll take questions? Oh, yes, please. Take a few minutes for questions. Anyone? I came late, but uh, where is the site? It's Abu Sir. It's uh, just between uh, Giza on north and Saqqara to the south. So it's just uh, in between uh, location between Giza and Saqqara. So if you are in Abu Sir, you can see uh, Djoser on the south and uh, uh, Khufu in the north. So it's a great spot. And actually just north, north of Abu Sir are uh, those uh, sun temples of the fifth uh, dynasty kings. So it's a brilliant spot. Is it open for visit? Not really, no. Uh, it, 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 it will be open. It should have been open last year, I think, but it's uh, redated every year to the next year, but uh, luckily next year it will be open. So we try our best to uh, prepare the site for the tourists. We, we, we tried our best to prepare the tombs for the tourists, because probably the tomb of uh, UFA might be open someday, because it's Marks with all the text around the body, uh, but it's uh, as I said, it's 20 meters below ground, so it's uh, difficult to access. But it was not looted. Sorry, it was not looted. Uh, not not the <coughs> intact uh, in perfect state. Yes. Yes, please. You are in Lake Britain and Houston, Texas. Would like to know if you were in forever back. Sorry? Uh, were the organs ever put back in the body? This is the question. Uh -huh. uh, in some uh, says the heart would be back. The heart is the center of the body. The heart is something really important for the person because the heart is the seat of the senses. It's the seat of the brain. It's the seat of the mind, is the seat of the soul. So you are dead. So that's why the heart is so important, and that's why the heart is important also during the famous uh, judgment of the dead. The heart should be weighted against the order of the world, and it should be in the same shape, same, same weight. So the heart, is, the heart should be there, definitely. So if you need to do something with the heart, you put it out and you have to put it back again. Uh, the red linen was used in particular cases. What it, the red linen was used in what cases versus not red linen? What, why, what's the significance of red versus not? Good question. <laughs> Difficult answers. Uh, uh, even the red, it, I mean, even the red part of the term is strange because uh, it originally we thought it's a red paint. So the it original uh, translation was red paint and bags, which was strange, but still. And then we find that they linen, which was strange as well, but. Our explanation is that the red in this case means something like, I must say, not white. That means not first class, because the determinative of the red is this bad bird. I mean, like, not evil, but it's like second handed. <laughs> it's. I, 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 I wouldn't say that. But. Because if you would use a dyed linen in red color, it would be 
terrifically expensive. So it's not the pure white linen. At least this is my explanation. And the red is the color of the linen, which is not really white. And, and especially the, the determinative says it's red or not nice. So that's why it might be called red linen, but it, it's our only, but not the only possible explanation. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, this is not a remark. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, and what I'm going to say is technical information, but it seems that even modern American morticians sort of evacuate the body liquid. They do not kind of interfere with uh, the uh, physiology, mm -hmm. but they drain, they make incisions in order to have some liquid. It has a special name, which I can mm -hmm. right now, um, in order to have that liquid, uh, and then start putting on the makeup. I see. Okay. So when your book starts on day 24, before you start the desiccation of what's left, Maybe you have to drain by gravity the body first. Definitely, it could be it could be uh, the case. It's just um, the twenty-four or twenty days. It's quite a long uh, period, so I would expect it would last like five days uh, maximum, and then. The first stage of this uh, of the desification comes. So I would uh, agree with you, but I would still think there is this uh, process of the taking a small amount of something out, and then the first stage of the desification by natron comes, and then it's the second stage because the 20 days it's still too long for all the preparatory stuff, but it could have been the case, yes. Thank you. How common is it to find wooden tablets, let alone plaster wooden tablets? Uh, I, I must say that uh, uh, those uh, wooden uh, tablets with uh, plaster probably used to be quite common in ancient times, but it's not uh, a common discovery because it gets can destroyed, so the discovery is quite uh, unique. You can, you can find or you can see actually uh, similar uh, tablets, I think, in the Metropolitan Museum in, in, in New York. These are uh, scribal tablets. I mean, I, I think some is stored even in the British Museum, but it's not in every museum, it's not everywhere. It's quite a unique, or not really unique, but it's not a uh, frequent discovery. But back in the ancient times, it was probably used quite often. But wood gets broken, stucco gets definitely broken. So it's not a free, frequent find like a papyrus scroll that get destroyed easily. Thank you. Yes, please. Is there any way that the red linen could mean something in the cloth? Uh, 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 a chemical uh, a substance that they would put in the cloth as part of the desiccation? Is there any way that that red could mean some kind of plant or tree bark or something that would relate to that process or it, not? It could be a great explanation. I just do not know. I just work with uh, the text I have. I work with the, the with the determinative, and it says red, and the determinative is either color or a bad thing okay. or or an an abstract word. So out of the three, we 
took the yeah. meaning, but it definitely could. But I think when you apply natron on the body, well, you don't need to add an extra value or thing extra to make it work even better. Yes, but as I said, uh, me myself, I didn't undertake any experiments, so <laughs> I do not actually know. Okay, and I wouldn't do the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Oh, yes, there were. There were. There were the remains of the resin. Uh, of uh, it's called coal. Uh, what is left from burning? There were remains of. Uh, uh, what's called in English? Hay. Uh, uh, there were uh, sand and mud uh, uh, and something that has to be still examined because we do not know what it is. But yes, the amphorae and the small vessels were not filled, but on the on the bottom there were these residues of those liquids and oils so yes the answer is yes <laughs> do you have any theories about why there were so many for the uh, uh, we think that he just paid a huge amount not of money, but of something else for his mummification. And we say it was like paid all inclusive style. <laughs> so he got everything they used for his mummification to be buried with him. But it's one of the possible explanations. I do not know, but it's strange. It seems that he was literally built with everything they used because there is this and for a hole with the rest of the burning, so you don't normally need it. But it's it seems like an all-inclusive mummification. <laughs> Actually, we realized only last year when we uh, asked our Egyptian colleagues to help us with identification and. It was the uh, cedar wood, so it was quite expensive. Yes, but as I said, it was not the best quality cedar wood. Most probably, uh, uh, how to put it, uh, used from a destroyed bookshelf or a shelf or something, because there's still you you, uh, you can see the joints in the tablets and small openings. So the story of Nikau's wooden book of the dead is a box, a destroyed box, a scribal tablet, a book of the dead, and an artifact. Great, thank so, you very much. Thank you. I believe uh, before we wrap up here, we have a gift. Go ahead, those two. Or uh, the other ones. <laughs> Adam's got it. You have to wait that interminable amount of time while somebody, you know somebody's giving you a gift and they have to walk over to you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> this is a Montanella, which is a reproduction of the Book of the Dead. Oh, it's a judgment the judgment scene. The judgment scene. And so this is in commemoration for your time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you so much. I'll take the microphone. Oh, yes. Good. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you're free to hang out for a little bit longer and finish up the wine and food. For those of you at home, you have to get your own. Join us next time. Thank you. Bye.